Good afternoon everybody. It is 2 p.m. here in England. It is Thursday and we are going to do another Instagram live. So we will wait for the system to wake up and to click through for people to join and for today's guest Jorge Delgado from uh, from Brandeis University will be joining us to talk about test optional admissions. So we will see whether we can get Jorge in pretty soon um, and we will go on to talk about um, about test optional emissions. It's a topic which obviously has an awful lot of importance right now in the US. Anyone who's been following along over the last couple of weeks will um, be aware that a lot of colleges have changed their test optional requirements. And Jorge, hopefully when he's able to request to join the Instagram Live, will be able to get in. So here we are. Hello, how are you, Jorge? David, good morning. How are you today, my friend? I'm doing very well. It's a lovely sunny day here, here in merry old England. How are things over you in, in Massachusetts? Very nice. It's a lovely spring day here in Massachusetts. Uh, I wish I could get outside, but obviously uh, we cannot uh, during these times. And um, yeah, we're just, we're just uh, moving along April here. It's, it's not the April any of us ever I uh, thought we would have, but uh, yeah. here we are. So, well, for a hardened road warrior like yourself, it must be quite hard not to be traveling to to wonderful parts of the world and promoting Brandeis. <laughs> I actually, I had a dream the other day. I was in an airport, and then uh, I woke <laughs> up and I was like, "Well, that definitely didn't happen." Um, no, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's a little sad being here. I mean, April is usually so full of of so many um, events that we have both on and off campus. Uh, we're starting to engage with uh, students who are juniors and, and uh, you know, uh, about to start their final year uh, in, uh, in secondary school. And um, it's just, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a little sad, but uh, we're, we're moving through it here. We're, we're doing everything that we can virtually. Um, we've actually had a really an interesting kind of suite of events for our admitted students. Um, and at the same time, uh, also started engaging with some younger students as well uh, through some virtual platforms. So. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's been interesting to say the least. Yeah, absolutely, great stuff. Well, for for those who don't know you, you Jorge, and, and those who don't know Brandeis University, do you mind spending a minute or two just giving a an overview and some context of the discussion we're going to have? Sure. Um, so uh, my my name is Jorge Delgado. I'm a uh, CEO, associate director of admissions at Brandeis University, um, and uh, I've been working at Brandeis for four years now, going on five. Uh, and I've been in, uh, in higher education and enrollment management about a decade now. So I worked at three different institutions. Um, Brandeis is a wonderful place to work. It's a wonderful place to, to go to school. Uh, it is uh, located just outside the great city of Boston. So it's only about 14, 15 kilometers outside the city center. Uh, and it is a kind of a suburban, very sort of traditional suburban uh, U.S. college campus. Um, we're sort of medium sized, right? We're about 3,600 students. Um, and uh, really kind of focusing on, on sort of blending this very strong liberal arts tradition that we have uh, with uh, kind of a, a top tier research environment. So we, we are amongst kind of the top tier research universities here in the United States, um, but we also uh, definitely have a strong kind of uh, level of academic flexibility and our students have a lot of agency in, in the kind of uh, academic environment uh, and academic path that they can follow. So. Um, that's a little bit about uh, uh, kind of the, the academic setup where we're a place that uh, is also very international. We're very committed to international education. 21% um, of our uh, undergraduate student population is international coming and representing from uh, almost 100 different countries, right? So wow. it's a place that uh, it really focuses on giving students a global education um, just by the, the kinds of people we bring to campus, uh, but also the kinds of programs that we have and the ways that we engage our students with the world. So. Great. I mean, I, I would echo everything you said. I, I was lucky enough to visit campus before you worked at worked at Brandeis, and I remember very much being being stood in the art gallery and thinking, "Gosh, these are really impressive um, reproductions of this 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 Pollock and this Warhol and stuff." And then people went, "No, those are actual the real ones." And and yeah. uh, really, for me, knowing that yeah, there's there are these wonderful universities like Brandeis, which potentially don't have the same name brand recognition in the UK that they really should do. Um, right. Awesome opportunities for students, um, and, and I've, I've teared Jorge up to this because I want to hear him pronounce the, pronounce the name. You have a British ne British named cafe on, on campus. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so we call it Chums because yeah. over here on this side of the pond, that's what we can say. Um, but uh, it, it's actually it's named after um, the, the campus photographer 
um, at the time uh, had a had a hound had a had a really loyal papa a really nice companion uh, and uh, named uh, uh, and I, I'm honestly like I, I'm having a hard time pronouncing it but I think it's uh, Chalmundley uh, I think we well we, we would say, we would say Chumley but yes oh, Chalmundley I love that. Um, so, pe so people from the UK will feel at home on Grand Ice just for that little bit of, of cultural <laughs> um, heritage there. Great. It's true. It's true. Uh, it, awesome. it, it, it is actually located in um, what used to be a, a residence hall that was built uh, as a castle. And now that's not impressive, I think, to when I talk to people in the UK, because that's where castles actually come from. Our castle was very sort of Americanized. But uh, it's since actually been, uh, Chums is still there, uh, which is a coffee shop. Uh, and then uh, the the building around it has been totally redone. So there's been a total reno on that. Uh, but it's uh, it's still a cool place to go. Students really love it. Um, you know, uh, it's had a, a really uh, a long life, and I think a lot of traditions. And when alumni come back, that's one of the places they 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 love going to. So. Great. Well, I would certainly say to anyone that joining the call today, if you're visiting colleges in, in Boston, uh, get an Uber, get out of the city, go and see Brandeis and others in the metropolitan area. So you get the best of both worlds, I feel. You get a really strong campus experience, all the wonders of that. But Boston's pretty pretty close to get to. And Jorge and his team will give you a, a good tour around as well. Um, the, the focus we're talking today, and Jorge has, has heard me poke him and provoke him and various things about <laughs> the, the, the old test optional policy that Brandeis used to have. And, and for those who, who don't know, Brandeis for many years didn't require SAT or ACT for American um, citizens or students educated in the US, but did internationally. You have been amongst the, the vanguard of the wave of universities that have responded to COVID-19 by now saying, no, we are, we are completely test optional for, for upcoming cycles, no SAT or ACT required. Could you talk through what that actually means in practice for applicants uh, and sort of key elements of how therefore students might be assessed, particularly maybe for an audience here who've never heard of test optional U.S. admissions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, I'll share a little bit. I mean, uh, Brandeis was actually one of the, the earlier schools to, to even pilot the, these kinds of programs. Right. Um, we started in 2013. Uh, and so that was before uh, I think the waves really started to kind of build. And so. You know, um, our policy was one that that, uh, you know, it was a pilot program, just like many folks are sort of announcing now. Uh, in 2013, Brandeis uh, announced uh, its pilot program, um, which is the policy that we still have to this day, because we found that it worked. We found that that, that students uh, were, were responding well to it. Uh, and so the way that it works is that we really are giving uh, applicants uh, three options, uh, three buckets sort of to, to sort of choose between uh, when they're applying to university, right? The first is a sort of standard SAT or ACT, one or the other, it, it doesn't matter. Um, that's the sort of standardized testing route. We do super score both exams. Uh, and so students can feel free to send us all of their score results and we will super score for them. The second um, is uh, uh, sort of a, a bit sort of nuanced because it's, it's sort of the a la carte option. That's what I like to call it. Uh, it's where students are submitting non-SAT or ACT test scores, right? Uh, and so in the past, that was limited to AP advanced placement exam results, uh, IB predicted scores or actual scores for students taking uh, IB programs, uh, and then SAT twos. Uh, but something that we've done with this current expansion is actually expanded the list of exams um, that students uh, are able to submit as part of that test optional two. Um, and uh, students, for example, from the UK will be able to use their predicted A-levels or if they've already sat A-levels, they'll be able to use A-level exams. Uh, students uh, in, in the French system with the French Bach will be able to send us those exams or a German Abitur. Um, so we have expanded the list of, of exams to include uh, sort of trusted and, and known uh, national exams outside the United States. Um, the third test option is, is uh, the real optional piece, right? Because in lieu of submitting any testing at all, um, uh, students are actually submitting what we call the GAP, which is the graded analytical paper. Uh, and so students are choosing um, basically a body of work, a piece of work, uh, academic, that they've done that they feel very proud of, that they believe can, can be a stand-in essentially for the testing uh, that they are not submitting. Uh, and so it's not that students are applying to Brandeis without submitting any, any testing, what they're doing is they're choosing uh, something essentially to replace that testing. Uh, and especially with that paper, um, it's something that's interesting because we've heard students uh, kind of fret about this uh, and, and they say, well, do I have to write something specifically for this? And, and really that's not um, the point of the policy, right? The point of the policy is not to give you something additional to do. Uh, the point of the policy is to give you uh, the opportunity to look at kind of your academic 
portfolio and say, you know what I'm really proud of? Like this particular piece of work. Um, we do have some guidelines, right? We ask that it be uh, expository writing from kind of a core discipline. Um, but uh, I know that students, for example, in IB programs have to do their extended essay. And so uh, drafts uh, of that, I, I think, are very useful once they, they start looking more complete toward, toward a final stage. Uh, and I know, for example, uh, that students that, that uh, are, are preparing to sit A-levels uh, can do a lot of writing as well. Uh, that, that uh, you know, those, those uh, assessments are, are, are sort of potentials for, for that particular piece. And so we have uh, essentially expanded uh, access to those three policies. Um, and so now any student, any applicant, regardless of citizenship, is able to choose between the three of them. And so when we talk about test optional, right, I mean, I think specifically for Brandeis, and we can get into kind of the, the, the larger trends in a minute, uh, what we're doing is, is giving students agency, giving students the choice uh, to decide what is the best vehicle for them to apply to the university, right? We will always be looking at your overall academic profile uh, to speak to your potential when you get to university. Uh, but when it comes to this particular requirement, um, what is the best option for you as an applicant? And so that's really what we're trying to do is give students the option uh, to, to choose between what we have to offer uh, and, uh, and, and there's different programs, right? There's different philosophies, different schools do it different ways. And so it's important to really understand kind of what each university here in the U.S. is providing when they say test optional. Correct. Well, we'll delve into those trends. I think you're, you're a very connected and um, knowledgeable man about the sector as a whole, Jorge. For, for those who are just joining, uh, my guest today is Jorge Delgado from Brandeis University, um, just outside Boston in the United States. If you've missed um, the start, you'll be able to watch it back on my Instagram story for 24 hours, and I'll also get it up uploaded onto my Facebook page at the University Guys, so you can um, also get the benefit not only of see hearing Jorge's wisdom, but seeing his beautiful house as well. So... Um, <laughs> The bigger trends then, then Jorge. You know, we've had news come out yesterday of, of Cornell with a with a potentially quite interestingly worded policy. We've got test blind. We've got test flexible. Again, someone completely new to this idea who'd assumed that there was only a thing called the SAT and you absolutely had to take it. Where should people be thinking about where U.S. admissions might be going for upcoming cycles and with testing? I mean, I think that, you know, it's, uh, I obviously wish I had a crystal ball for, for, for so many things. And I know, I mean, I've seen actually friends joining uh, Brandy from Rollins and uh, Tara from Wesleyan, uh, I think are, are hopping on here. And, uh, you know, we all wish uh, kind of on the higher ed side um, that we knew that we knew what was going to happen. Right. But, but as far as kind of these trends, I think um, in, 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 in test optional, it really is uh, giving students kind of, kind of more choice. Right. I, I think that, um, a system that is that is rigid uh, doesn't really fit with the, the ethos of, of American higher education. Right? The yeah. whole point of coming to uh, to the U.S., if you look at kind of the course of study, is to choose what you want to do to explore a curriculum uh, in both breadth and depth. Um, and so I think that the flexibility that uh, the test optional um, programs give is totally in line uh, with that that kind of ethos. And so I think you see a lot of schools. Uh, trying this out for the first time. Um, I think, uh, you know, given the situation with COVID-19 uh, and the restricted access to, uh, to testing around the world and what I would call the increased uh, uh, restrictions for students yeah. overseas, right? Uh, because there was always a disparity there, um, has really um, uh, pushed and, 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 and uh, had universities really take a look at kind of what policies they had in place uh, and highlighted particularly how uh, restrictive it was. Uh, and so now, instead of doing away with the tests, right, I mean, I think the tests do have some validity. I, I, I think that we could discuss that till, uh, till the <laughs> yes. end of the day here, but that, that's not what we're here to do. I think the tests do say some things. Um, and so it's about giving students kind of those options. And, you know, we've seen many schools uh, start this pilot, these kind of pilot programs. I think, I think schools will like it, right? I mean, I think I'm speaking from my experience working at yeah. an institution that's been doing this for seven years. Um, I think schools will like it because it allows them to, to really uh, lean on looking at the student as a whole entity and not just boiling students down to a single number. I, I agree completely. I mean, friends who, who are joining the call, and we, it's very nice to see some, some good people who, whose company I miss <laughs> joining us. Um, well, no, I used to be a history teacher and I speak in analogies, but the thing that occurs to me, and particularly maybe that statement from Cornell that came out is, seemed to be written by a committee and, and the joke being that, you know, a camel was a, a horse designed by committee. Um, <laughs> but it seems to me a bit like my, my kids sometimes. I put a meal in front of them and they don't want to eat it because they think they know better. And then after, you know, three or four spoonfuls, they go, oh, actually, this, this is okay. And I think maybe 
some of your your peer institutions who are who are sort of being forced by necessity to try out test options might go actually you know what this this is actually not too bad and you know would you think that a decent chunk of those colleges um particularly those private institutions which maybe don't have state law kind of constricting them will stay test optional after a one year or a three year pilot do you think that's the way things are going um, I think that, you know, as, as uh, putting sort of my enrollment hat on, um, and I, I think that uh, a test optional, while it makes it dif more difficult uh, in, the, in the, the way to run sort of an equitable process, right, you need to have sort of checks and balances about each of the options that you're having. Um, you need to be really thoughtful and deliberate about how you roll it out, about um, how you are, are promoting it and, 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 and advising students, I think, properly on the options that exist. Um, it makes it harder, but at the end of the day, um, you are given as an enrollment manager uh, a lot more options, right? As far as the kinds of students you're attracting, number one, uh, but also uh, the ability to see students through different sort of dimensions, right? Yeah. Uh, and not just having kind of one lens um, be the end all, be all, right? And so it, it is about sort of that balance. And that's something that, I mean, I, I mentioned, you know, I've been doing this uh, for a little bit now. And, and from the very beginning, it was about, you know, what kind of balanced approach can we take? Are, are we using, um, even for a personal profile, right? We use a student's writing, we use a, a personal statement, we use recommendations written by others, we use the view of a school. Um, so there's so many lenses that we take a look at uh, and use to look at students. Um, why don't we also apply that to kind of the academic side of the house when we're looking yeah. at a student's academic profile. So, um, I mean, it, it really does behoove people to really read at, you know, and, and be informed individually about what each institution is doing. And we talk about this uh, with, with U.S. admissions all the time, that it depends, right? It depends. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I, I think every, every university is going to be rolling this out in their own way. And um, uh, it's hard because we are, especially these times, right, the, the times of COVID really trying So um, it's, it's hard to do that, uh, but, but I think that uh, my colleagues at other institutions, everyone is trying to do right by their institutions and do right by their students. Uh, and I think that is uh, all we can ask for right now. Absolutely, great stuff. Well, and as you, you've explained, test optional does not mean test blind. I mean, there are some colleges, a very few that, that say that we won't even look at them if you send them. Right. You know, a student who might still have the ability to take a test, you know, if you've got a student who wants to come into a, a quantitative subject, a maths two subject test might be something that, you know, if they've, if they've aced that, they've got a good score, that would be helpful. Right. Um, a student who's, you know, really serious about um, languages, getting in a, a language test, that, those kind of things should all still be part of the puzzle. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it is about giving us different tools to use um, for, for that assessment. And then now just inviting students to, to, to be part of the selection of those tools, right? Um, and so that is really uh, uh, w what it is. And um, I mean, I'm, I'm excited for it because I have been a proponent about, uh, you know, for these kinds of policies for since the beginning of, of my career in this. Um, but to really kind of see it come to fruition and, and, and to be able to now uh, not only sort of announce, but really see come through the pipeline uh, st students who are, I know and, and, and I feel very confident are going to be good fits for the university, are going to be very successful, uh, and this will allow us to, to find even more of those students, and, and that's something that I'm really excited about. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well you're, yourself and, and you know, some of our friends who are on the call and, and others who have been trailblazers in this, I think you deserve a, a huge amount of credit. Um, creating policies and a body of evidence that meant that in these extreme situations, you know, an enrollment manager at a university can go to their leadership and go to the faculty and say, look, Brandeis has been doing this, other colleges have been doing this for years, and it's been good for them. Why don't we give this a go? So I think from the community are, are very grateful and we're celebrating along with you when you were able to, to break that news, news Jorge. So we, we hope that it, it continues to go well and, and you can still serve as an example to, to other schools. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're all, uh, you know, in a wonderful sort of higher ed environment here. And uh, that's one of the things I love about this industry is that it is very collaborative. We learn from one another. Uh, I've learned so much from, from colleagues at other universities, from campus partners at my own institutions. Um, and it, it really is a field, I think, that lends itself to, to people wanting to learn from one another. Uh, and, and that can only really benefit students. So that's, Agreed, that's, agreed. And, and I, I owe you another dinner at Deshoom in London the next time you're over here. I know it's, I know it's a, I love it. it's a it's particular a favorite. favorite. It is an absolute personal favorite, yes. Absolutely. So if people want to find out more about Brandeis, they want to get hold of, hold of you, where can they go online to get hold of you? What's the best way to, to reach you or to research the institution? 
so brandeis.edu uh, is obviously our website. I would definitely point people there. At Brandeis Admissions is our uh, official sort of Instagram account for the office. And we roll out wonderful content there for any students that are interested. Uh, so just follow at Brandeis Admissions. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, it's a wonderful place. Uh, we'd love to have you back. I know you've been on, on campus already, but I want to have you back now that I'm here uh, yeah. and, and show you kind of what's changed. And I look forward to, to my next trip uh, over, uh, over to London and over to, the, to England. Uh, when we can reunite, my friend. That'd be great. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Jorge. I appreciate it. Um, my guest next week, she's, she's on the call. She's clapping us right now. Will be the wonderful Brandy Franson from, ah, from Rollins College. Um, we're going to talk about that. absolutely. We're going to talk about the difference between the liberal arts and the fine arts, as as to what are the differences between them. And Brandy's own own career, both as a practicing artist and working in higher ed, spans those two elements. So I'm really looking forward to that same time, I will same be there. place I will next be week. In. That will be a wonderful show. I plug it for everybody that's watching. There we go. Fantastic. So so thank you, Jorge, so much, given of your time. Thank you, everyone, for for watching. And if you have just come in, look at the story in about five minutes will be up there. If you want to watch it back, you'll be able to, to see the, um, probably the best dressed man in higher education will be on my <laughs> Facebook. Um, and I definitely don't mean myself. So have a good day, everyone, Jorge. Look after yourself day, and I hope David. to see you Thank soon. Thank you. Take care. Bye.